Welcome to Amway Arena. Kobe Bryant and the Los Angeles Lakers are one win away from another championship. Benga throws it back. Kobe, the acrobatic finish. The championship trophy returns to its West Coast home. It's game seven of the 2010 NBA Finals. Benga, the rebound. A test. Fires a three. He got it. The Lakers have won back to back. DJ, you know it's a pleasure having you today in this platform, No Limit, which you know is a platform that puts a highlight into impactful Africans, but also international leader as you are. So thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure for me to have a DJ Mbenga, the greatest. <laughs> so I really am um, looking really forward for this conversation. But mm -hmm. as a start, I want to know, you know, DJ, you're tall. Yeah. Uh, was were you born with the basketball DNA in you when you were a kid? No, really, because it, it wasn't something I wanted to do. I was dreaming about it. Oh. Yeah, just being kids and growing up and, you know, you know, don't realize you start getting tall. Yes. And you becoming like a joke for some other friend. Yes. You can't hang out with your friend because you want to hang out with people they're a little bit older because they look, they, you have the same height. So the, the moment also you start thinking different. You can't think like your friend because you hang with the people they hold on you just because of high. But, uh, you know, and it, it gets to the point I have to accept this high. And, but it was still friend, people pushing me, playing basketball. I just don't like it. So I started to do judo okay. to protect myself because most of the guys, they're like, oh, if I want to fight you, just catch you on the legs. <laughs> so in you school, don't. everybody yes. make the joke, so I was like, no, I got to protect myself. Yes. And I started doing martial arts, judo stuff. You know, trying to touch everything, yes. judo a little bit, karate, yes. boxing stuff. Yeah. I see. But you know, you were a kid from Limba. Yes. This town in Kinshasa. Yeah. You have any memories of? Oh, absolutely. I cannot forget where I, mm. I was born and grew up. Yes. You know, and um, every time when I come back home, come back in town, I always take a moment to go over there. I see. Take a look at my street, to my neighborhood. And I see. Few parents pass away. Just go show my respect to different family. And I'm uh, trying to help the best I can. You know, it's my neighborhood. So. Definitely. You left Congo and then you went to Belgium, Belgium. where you play for a team, Spin Charleroi. Yes. How was the experience in that Belgium championship? Well, Belgium, first of all, when I get there, I didn't even play basketball. Okay. It was uh, one person who stopped me on the street who asked me if I want to play basketball. Okay. And, uh, but that time, I didn't even like it. So you did not go to Belgium with the idea of playing basketball No. There. I see. No. And that time, I didn't even like it. So, and then, it, you know, he pursued, he followed me, yes. asking me to come practice. And then, um, you know, one day, he took me, introduced me to another guy. Okay which is happening, he's the one of the all the time best uh, Belgian player, but he was a point guard. I see, I see. The person, he is the one now taking me to the next level. Yes. Practice six, seven hours a day, and he makes sure my environment, everybody, friends, everybody I have, they always be in a circle of a basketball. I see. And if I'm not there, He's going to film an NBA game. Mm -hmm. When I came back, we're going to sit with him. So basically, 24 hours, it was 24 hour basketball. And he was so fast. And then after one year, mm -hmm. alone, and I started playing. Start from junior. Mm -hmm. We have a junior team. The goal, it was enough for us to win. The goal, it was to play for me. OK, <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, it was to play for me, for me to understand the game. Okay. Game situation, because when you're learning basketball, you only learn one-on-one -on -one situation. Definitely. But when you go play five-on-five, five, you lost. Definitely. Because you don't know the game situation. You don't understand the game. True. And that's why they have that junior team and give me this platform. They will play for me, and they help me to learn the game, to understand you know, the position, what to do. It, 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 it doesn't matter if I score 100. I see. The point was for me just to understand the, the game. game. And then from there, take to the third division. Yes. From third division, the progress it was so fast. Mm -hmm. And then I was going to practice with the, uh, uh, a professional team. And I was performing so good against the guy there from college. I see. I see. You know? And that was just impressed. And then sure. the team of Charleroi 
finally gave me a contract. That time I was, uh, after two years playing basketball, mm. it, was, it was amazing. Like I, I have that. a same contract, I'm American guy who be playing in college yes. and become professional, which I wasn't. True. You know, and uh, it was just a blessing for me. You know? And then it went from there to Charleroi, and Charleroi, we went to Europe Cup, yes. uh, Euro League, yes. and then we ended up winning a championship. Definitely. And uh, because I know already, I, I got invited mm -hmm. to go uh, do the tryout with the Dallas Mavericks for the summer league. Yes. And uh, I didn't want to tell anybody, but right after we win, I think about three days later. I went first. No, I went first to the um, big man camp okay. in Italy because back then they used to have a big man camp in Italy. Okay. All the scouting work they come there. And then as uh, soon as I get, I got there. Everybody knew I was coming, so all the scouting they was waiting for me. Attention was on you. Yeah. And then that time, Dallas Mavericks scout was there. Okay. And they just come to my room. They're like, "Listen, you can't be here. You gotta go back." to the Belgium. I'm like, why? Uh -huh. like, no, you gotta go back because we just don't want to expose you here. I see, I see. And I left, we created excuse like I have an ankle or something like that, uh, ankle problem, and I came back to the Belgium. And two days later, my invitation, everything, my uh, ticket flight, and I fly over there. Wow, so you went to the state mm -hmm. and to participate in the summer league? Yes. Host by the yeah. Dallas it, it, Even when I was gone, even when people find out, and then I'm, I'm going to, I, I'm, yeah. I'm in the state, mm -hmm. they was just like, oh, he won't gonna make, he's not gonna make it. He's just, nah, nah, nah. Really? Just because he's tall, because yeah, yeah. he's he physical. He thinks he can make it. Yeah, that's why he's over there. He's not gonna make it, so. But I know, Yes. I knew, yes. I knew what I want. Definitely. So I get there and, um, you know, and that was also the first time me meeting Yao Ming. Okay. Because they was there also, do the workout for national team, China national team. Okay. And. When I get there, so it was just the summer league team. Before the summer league, they asking me if I can play with them. Yes. And I asked my agent, she's like, yeah, just go perform. And I went there, I was black, Yao Ming, and do all kind of stuff. Really? And my Cuban, the owner, yeah. <laughs> that time, he can pronounce my name Didier. Okay. So he called me DJ. DJ. And from there, <laughs> stick with DJ. <laughs> Made sense. Now I understand why the DJ. Yes. Because people, they always think, like, you know, America, they always have a union show. Definitely. Yeah, people, they always say, but what DJ mean? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> it's just people, they can't pronounce the DJ, they call me DJ. So coming back to the year when it actually started, and you joined the first team. Mm -hmm. How's it going in your I mean, mind? first, when we went to, I think that time in Summer League, it was in, a, it was in LA before. LA, Orlando, and Vegas. So we went to Orlando, and when we get to the Orlando, it was just... Great because that time Dwight Howard, yes, yeah, he just came to the league. Me and him, we came to the league. Okay, I so see. me and him, it was just like I see. We, it was, it the was competition just was high. Yeah, yes. it was just a great. This guy is so great. He's strong, and it was just a great. And uh, we, I, I have a great summer league. That time my teammate with the Dallas Mavericks was Josh Howard. Okay. Um, Devin Harris, we came the same year. Me and, me and him and Marquis Daniels. So we was all young guys. Definitely. We were just we was winning. It was just so fun. And when we get to the LA, it was just so great. And then um, my agent called me after one, after one game, he called me. He's like, yo, um, this envelope is coming under your door. Okay. Just open and sign and send it back downstairs to the lobby. I'm like, okay, I was tired. I just, I just take the envelope, I open. And you know, NBA contract is a one page. Yes, yes. And I saw this. Contract. <laughs> I didn't really want to pay yeah. attention. I just assigned. You signed it. And I sent it back. Okay. And after he got it, he called me and said, Congratulations, big time. Till today, he always called me big time. <laughs> he said, Congratulations, big time. I'm like, What's up? He's like, You're just making an NBA. Wow. I'm like, Oh my God. He was like, Okay, in a couple hours, it's going to be in the news. Okay. So I have to prepare you, I have to tell you what to do, and you have to be calm, everything, because that time it was a big time because I was the first ever Belgium player. Okay. And at, at that moment, mm -hmm. were you good with English? No. I see. Not at all. I see. And one point, I was not even a Belgium citizen yet. Okay. Yes. I signed as a Congolese. I see. But... <laughs> I was playing already in the Belgium national team.
<laughs> That's tricky, right? Very. Because they have this thing they used to call uh, uh, Cotonou deal, something like that. So those foreign African players, yes. they can play in Europe team professional. With, because all the teams, you have to have uh, two American guys. But African, they also be, so you have a three. And that allowed me also to join a national team. Okay. But I was not playing official game. I was playing just a, 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 a practice game, you know, and stuff like that. And then when I make the league, it was on the news everywhere. Uh, and two weeks later, they come in the office and NBA, they're like, uh, you have an envelope. And I open. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, just like that. Wow. That's amazing as a story. Just like that. Yeah, it was a passport. Wow. So you're stepping into the court yeah. with Dallas Mavericks. I mean, he was, I'm telling you, and we, we, we started a training camp. Yes. And that's how the, the problem started because my English was not ready. I was not ready to speak because basketball terminology is always English. Exactly. And I was lost. But Dirk Nowitzki helped me because he's from Germany. Yeah, yeah, Dirk. And he showed me <laughs> yeah. stuff. You know, and uh, it, it was just so, you know, first year you, you're learning, you know, you're learning. And then uh, for me, after you play, you finish the season, I had to go back to national team. Okay. So for me, national team, it was the way, I, it was like a practice. I go over there just performing free, not pressure, just to continue to improve my game, to come back to the league, to, be, to continue to be better and better. How would you rate your first season with the Mavericks? Uh, the first season, it, it was learning season. Yeah. It was a learning season. It was just, uh, you know, you come to the league as a young player. If I was to the team, like, team don't want to, they don't have no goal to win a championship, yeah. just to, just regular team, it could be different. But I came to team that was pretend to win a championship. Definitely, for sure. They need a vet. They want to understand the game. They be in the game. And that was my first problem. I see. Yeah. Plus my English, that one set me back just a little bit, yeah. Did you have a role model on your first season, a player that influenced you the I, most? I, absolutely, because you know, like I told you beginning, as a young man who become, becoming tall, you really don't like that. And then when you start hearing people talk about Mutombo, 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 and then even when I try a little bit to go to play the owner try, they change my name over there, start calling me Mutombo. Mutombo. And my friend stuck on me, Mutombo. So I'm like, let me find out who's that guy. <laughs> and then one day, I was sick. Yeah. I was laying on the couch, watching TV. And I never forget, it was a sport mania with uh, the great yeah. Nzila. Nzila for that. And um, they was, he was showed a little documentary and show Mutombo life in Denver. I see. Then I'm like... Oh, that's him. That's the guy. That's him. That's the guy. <laughs> yes. And another person, it was uh, Constant Omar. Okay. Because yeah. he's pretty tall, too. Yeah. Because when I saw that guy pull up, I never forget, he had this truck called Trooper. Okay. Pull up on that. I'm like, what is this? this? <laughs> and he was dressed nice, everything. He was tall. I'm like, whoa, I want to be like this guy. I see. And plus Mutombo, yes. I'm like, I want to be like him. More I was learning the game, more I started discovering some other players. But Mutombo was still my reference. Definitely. It was still, till today, it's my hador. Yes. It's my, my big brother, my friend. It's my guy. Yes, I agree. As you continue your journey, tell me, you moved from uh, Dallas to Golden State. How did that happen? What happened it was, again, Finally, when I started get opportunity to play, yes, because we, that time we have a coach Avery Johnson, and Avery was a player, mm -hmm. so Avery understand then my problem it was communication. That's why it was kind of set me back a little bit. Yes. So he high, his high school coach, okay, for me, okay, and I always thank him for that. Mm. So he hired, he hired his high school coach for me, and that high school coach now start teaching me. The fundamental of a basketball in English. I see. I see. Terminology. Yes. Everything. And then from there, we went again to the summer league, and that summer league I was just good. Yeah. 
I was black inside. It was just a good. And every, because you know, when you go to summer league, so you play every day. After two games, every come to a locker room, he's like, DJ, that's enough. I'm really see. Because he know I was going to a national team as well. So he's like, go to the national team, then we send the coaches okay. over there to follow up with you. Okay. And I went, and then the national team, again, it was great. And then when I came back, he started playing me now. I started back up Dirk Nowitzki as a four okay. and five. I started playing two positions. And then uh, the, the, that time, it was great till I got hurt against uh, Paul Gasol again. Ooh. Yeah, we would play against the Memphis that time, and Paul trying to penetrate, and I was trying to stop him, but I slide, he slide on me. Again, another SCL I have before. Yes, yes, yeah. Now the other legs. So that did take me again six months of surgery, re-education, and you know, just trying to gain back this confidence again, because you're going to play with the brass and stuff, you know. And from there, when I came back, actually, that is my wish. We have a problem with the point guard. Okay. I think it was Jet Terry was hurt, something like that. And they need a new point guard. So that position now, they, they got to trade someone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they can't really trade anybody. And me, I was coming back from the injury. Yes. So my Cuban, that's why me and him, we still friends to today. Mm -hmm. He came to me, he was like, listen, DJ, I understand the situation. And it's like, and I didn't want to leave. I was really hurt because that time, I got my house, I got some, some investment stuff we do over there. So I was just, Dallas was like a hometown for me. Definitely. I just love it. Yeah. And he just explained to me, my agent explained to me, I was, I was crying, I'm like, I cannot live here. I love here, I cannot live here because I know everybody. And that team, the Dallas Mavis, only no whiskey was there. The rest of the guys, we all come together. Okay. So we learning each other, we play each other for like, couple years, so it was hard for me to leave them. And he told me, say, DJ, just go, you never know. Someone is gonna give you a chance. Yes. You might win a championship, you never know. Mm -hmm. And then when he told me that, I'm like, okay, he building another anger on me. Sure. Sure. I'm like, okay, and then you know, news by Belgium, you know, some those people even not gonna make it, you know, it's <laughs> over. And I would just home, chill, and my agent called me, he was like, you have to go to Golden State. I said, when am I going to Golden State? Why you can't just negotiate with the Dallas Mavericks? Yeah. They can so bring can me back. Here. Yeah. He said, no, you got to go to Golden State. Why? Because the coach who was in the Golden State, Don Nelson, mm -hmm. he was the one signed me with the Dallas Mavericks. Okay. So okay. he knows me. Yes. He wanted me to be there. Mm -hmm. And I went there. I went to the dinner with him. He just like, you know, tomorrow I want to see you in practice. Ready to go. I'm like, coach, but we didn't sign anything. <laughs> I said, I want to see you tomorrow practice. Okay. And that's what happened, you know. And I started playing with a great team. I have my teammate like Matt Brown, yes, like yes. Uh, Stephen Jackson, Alan Arlington, you know, uh, Monte Ellis, um, Austin Crusher. I, I, it, it was a lot of them. It was just a great, it was just a guy, a young guy. We, we were just having fun. And then again, over the same situation. And I was coming back from knee injury because I have to build in my confidence and they have to let me go again. So I was like, wow, I don't know, maybe I need to go back to Europe. Wow. So I think like that. Mm -hmm. and then my agent called me. Actually, I was watching game, mm -hmm. my hotel room, watching the Lakers play. Mm. Andrew Barnum felt hurt his need. And I'm like, wow, I feel sorry because Too I bad. know yes, the, the pain. pain. So I'm like, nah, he's a young guy, you know, talent. I just feel sorry for him. And then my agent called me directly. Okay. And she's like, DJ, someone is going to call you. Just be nice and so listen. It goes that fast? Oh, it goes fast. Because that's how it works. They, every team have a plan B already. Even if guys, they healthy. You always got to anticipate. Definitely. So he was like, yeah, you need to be ready, you know. Somebody's going to call you and, uh, you know. And I'm like, okay. And I was already just disappointing. I'm like, I might just go back to Europe. And then my phone rang. Pick up the phone. Phil Jackson. The great Phil Jackson. Yes. Hey, big guy, how are you? I'm like, uh, I'm great. This is Coach Phil. I'm like, oh my God, Coach Phil. I send the position. I'm like, hey, Coach. 
It's like, yeah, um, we want you to come here tomorrow, you know. And they send flight stuff, man, about, and I went there. And the day I got there, they were playing against Miami. Okay. And Shaq already went to Miami. Yes, yes. <sighs> Shaq was just killing me. The beast. Killing. And I was just sitting watching. And then at halftime, they was passed by me. Okay. And fear, he saw me. He just moved his head like that. And he walked to the locker room. And then after the game, it went fast. Because after the game, one of the media came to me. He was like, oh, so you happy to be able to you're gonna be a Lakers? I'm like, what? He just started. You got to pick it up. Yeah. I didn't even sign you. <laughs> so you told me, like, you know, you, you're going to love you. You think you're going to be uh, uh, help with Kobe and stuff? I'm like, what? What is he what? talking about? <laughs> and then, um, you know, just next day I went to practice. You know, they walked me out and... They dislike me, and they give me first 10-day contract. Yes. Yeah, 10-day contract. Mm -hmm. I didn't play because I have to learn the triangle system. Yes. And then after 10 days, they give me another 10-day. And I start playing a little bit. I start learning the triangle pretty good, and then they give me for the rest of the season. And, and then I was, even before I got there, like, it was just me and Kobe, it was just, we played Dallas against uh, LA, LA. I was blocky shot. I was going blocky shot. You just play hard, do the best I could just to, to, to perform at the high level as possible. And that effort, I think he loved that. Because I guess that's when you, you started playing as a center, right? Yes. Okay. And I think that effort, Kobe loved that. Okay. Because when I get to the LA, he reminded me that. Mm -hmm. So he came next to me, so he was like, listen, I want you to do the same thing you do against me when I come to the basketball. That's all I want you to do for now. But how does it feel to have two rings? It feels great. Just like Kobe told me. Yeah. Whenever a header, you can take it to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, talking about Kobe Bryant, mm. why do you say or consider Kobe Bryant as the uh, Barack Obama of basketball? I'm going to tell you this. It's still hard for me to today yeah. to process, mm -hmm. you know, to accept that it's not there no more. Mm -hmm. It's hard when you have a friend who you been around with him, you saw him, I'm not saying cry on a hard time, mm -hmm. play with the injury, mm -hmm. practice hard, give it to everything you can on the court. Mm -hmm. And losing championship with him, being sad, and just when you go play for national team, he's follow up with you. He was like, DJ, listen, I need you to go over there. I need to work on this, this, because you know, next year, we gotta go back to the finals. Not just with me, yes, with all of us as a teammate, mm -hmm. you know. And it create this ambience on the team. Mm -hmm. We become like a family. We become like a son. It was not the Kobe people thought it was the arrogant. No. Yeah. If you practice hard, you play hard, and you performing that level, mm -hmm. there's no more people they don't think like you kind of like. True, true. You know? But it's not that. He just do what he do, what he does in practice. That's yeah. what he do yeah. on the court. There and, are... and, and, and for it's it just too hard because imagine you talk to the person the night before. And the next day, you heard the news like that. This morning, new video of what appears to be Kobe Bryant's helicopter taken just 30 minutes before it crashed by a homeowner living under its verified flight path. How did you process it? I was in the bed. I was in the bed when my phone started ringing in the morning. And I was just like, I'm tired, I'm just asleep. And then my mom called me. When my mom called me, I pick up the phone, my mom cried. Because my mom used to love Kobe, the Lakers, Lamar. And my mom cried, I'm like, Mama, why are you crying? It's like, I'm sorry. I said, why you say sorry? He said, for Kobe. I'm like, what you mean for Kobe? It's like, you don't know? And my young sister picked up the phone, also crying. I'm like, why do you guys cry? Nah, Kobe, I'm 
I'm like, oh. First I hang on the phone, I'm like, let me just process a little bit. And then my phone keep ringing. Now it's, the, the, the call is coming from everywhere in the world. People calling me. And let me check your Facebook. I check your Facebook, I'm like, no way. Cannot be true. Star TV, no way, I'm like, no. So now I start shaking myself. Mm -hmm. Take my phone, call his number. Straight to the voicemail. I text him, I say, please, text me back. Nothing. And then I call his office. One of the ladies pick up the phone. And I ask him, I say, where's Kobe? And the lady say, oh, I'm sorry. And I hang up. And then I'm like, no, let me call his personal security. And then I call John. And as soon as John saw my number, he said, sir, I'm sorry. I hang up again. And then I call our trainer. And when I called Gary video our trainer, and Gary was crying with me on the phone. And I'm like, you know what? I stayed two days in the bed. Not eat, not drinking, chased in the bed to process. And then finally, I called Derek Fisher. When I called Derek Fisher, Derek and I quiet. Text to Lamar, text to Luke. Everybody was just in a shock. And just all the memory. Start, start coming, coming back. All the stuff he was telling me, all the stuff. Because he he's to be different with everybody. He was friend with everybody different category of friendship. With me, we're just different. Because he loved to learn. I teach him Lingala. <laughs> I teach him French. Okay. Kobe no Fali Pupa. Through you. Kobe no Kofi Olomide. Because of you. Kobe no Jibetan. <laughs> because we make a CD for him okay. and DVD. So when we fly, he always sit behind me. Yes. After the game, I always play. You know, back then it was like a DVD player. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I always play this some music, a video, coffee, Fali. I was watching. So he always behind me. Who's this? <laughs> Who's this? And then I have to explain him what the song mean. Explain me where they dance. He's like, this is great. This is great. I want it. So I'll make it for him. Yes. And he just have it. And then sometime we could be in a hotel. He texts me. Hey, come up. And I went to the room, we just sit, we just talk. And he asked asking me, say, so tell me, what, what, what's going on? Like, tell me, but talk about the Congo. He wanted to talk, tell me about the Congo, tell me about Africa. I guarantee you, if I was come to the Congo, uh, the Kobe here in the Kobe, because that was the plan. Okay. He would get a Congo's passport. Wow. Because they do just love Africa. Who then gave you the nickname of Congo Cash? Okay, that's a good question. Congo Cash. Congo Cash is start in practice. Okay. Was it because you always had cash on you? <laughs> no. Congo Cash is start in practice. In basketball, when you score, yes. you cash. Oh, makes sense. You know, even when they negotiate your contract, yes. they start, they're like, hey, look at state, look how many score, look yes. how many points, this, this. So that's you cashing. I see. And when I told you, I said, Phil told me to be me. Yes. Playing. Yes. So I start, if I'm open, I take the shot. I take the opportunity, everything I'm, I'm going to do, you know. And he was working in the practice. And then we take it to the game. I see. So we take it to the game. And <laughs> one game, it was just, I just blew on that yeah. game. And they asked him, they said, so what do you think about DJ performance? He's just like, yes, Congo Cash. <laughs> this is getting done, Congo Cash. A chance to talk about DJ Benga the last couple games. He's, he's becoming a fan favorite, but he's out there getting production too. Congo Cash, baby. <laughs> Congo Cash getting it done. And let's go from there for the first time, because we have a back-to-back -back game. Yes. No, not no, no back-to-back, but we have another game. I came to the gym. I'm believing. Can you imagine Staples Center? Yeah, yeah. All of them, they have on the seat, a T-shirt, and them, 
Congo cash. And they bring a big old box like that in the locker room in front of me. Kobe just look at me, hey, I want my loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> you can pay me that. Wow. And it go like everybody where everybody buy that day, buy that t-shirt. Congo cash. Congo cash. And let's go from there. Wow. And of course, Fali, <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> then talking about the present, mm -hmm. um, you were officially named as an ambassador of the ninth game of Francophonie, yes. which will take place in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Kinshasa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you feel about it? What I feel about it, it's, a, it's a great why. I'm going to explain you why. When I was growing up, even I didn't like a basketball, yeah. we don't have no gyms, no playground, even the basketball. If someone have a basketball, He's like the greatest in, on, in the neighborhood. Mm. Like everybody got, he worship him. I see the guy play with the no shoes, even I didn't like it. And that environment is hard for young guy to develop. Mm -hmm. You know, to develop their game. Why? Because we don't have enough infrastructure, sport, sport, sport wise. Definitely. So this Francophonie, it's one of the great ever thing ever happened for the, the Congo. Because yesterday I got a chance to go visiting some of the infrastructure. infrastructure. Yes. I saw three gym. If you told me that 20 years ago, mm -hmm. in the Congo we're going to have a three gym of a basketball play, or basketball because they can play volleyball, everything. I would never believe you. If you told me that 10 years ago, I will never, never believe you. If you told me that five years ago, I will never, because I used to come here, do the camp. Okay. The stuff I will see, the stuff I have to deal with, it was just not good. And it's not even motivate you to do it again. You know, you just like, what am I gonna do? It just, I'm just a cycle around, you know? Every, every year we do the same thing, this cycle around, we don't progress. And what I saw yesterday, that gave me more hope. Yes. That gave me more energy mm -hmm. to do better for those young kids. Because now we have a platform. Oh, definitely. This platform now is going to help those young guys to live from here yes. directly to the college. Because we're going to teach them terminology in English here. We're going to teach them the fundamental of basketball here. So when they live here, they go. So stopping those guys come here, do the camp, and take the kids, go over there, make a deal with the college or high school. Everything will he, be done here. They have to They'll stop. They'll be ready here. So now it's going to be here yes. with those gyms we have. And that's for me, it's a great. Because they will be prepared with infrastructure who the government yes. built for them. Yes. When they go over there, they make it, they know. Yes. I got to go back. Yeah. Do. Because if you talk about do the hospital, I do the school. Bismarck do another uh, school over there. Another one gonna do this, this, this. We contribute. Yes. And if we have uh, like five, six people like that every year, they're building something. Mm -hmm. We just continue to develop this country a different way because we not just have a diamond, gold, cotton. Also, we have a resource as a human. Yeah, as a human. Yes. Yeah. So you are confirming that Congo will host one of the biggest Francophonie game next year. Yes, it's gonna happen. Yes. That's why we're here, yes. to make sure it's gonna happen. Thank you, Didier. Didier, this time. <laughs> it was a pleasure for me to being able to host you, talk to you, and you really open up. And you told the story that some of us behind the screen, behind the TV or the computer, just know from, uh, from, you know, from the internet. But towards you, were able to really get deep into it. So I really uh, appreciate it and thank you no, so much. Thank, thank, thank you to give me opportunity, yes. the platform for me to talking and, yes. you know, to, yeah. to, to express myself, just um, clarify some of the stuff. Maybe people, they don't understand. Definitely. So like we said, the rendezvous is set for next year. It's going to happen. Yeah. And I'm going to repeat again, Lingala. It's even better. 9e G of Francophonie, Eko Salama. Sikoyo. Et Salemi. Moussa les Salama déjà. Les Salama, Moussa les Alipé et Salema. Ok. Donc, tout le monde a 
année prochaine, na juillet, na juillet, juillet, août, na juillet, août, 9e à juillet, août, 9e juillet, francophonie de Kinshasa. Il y aura plein de surprises, yes. surtout niveau basket. Yes, because you're there. Thank you, Didier. As you know, No Limit is this platform that puts a highlight on African, but also international, impactful leaders such as you. Thank you so much. Oh my God, it was a real dream. I'll be closing by saying, when you gotta do a job in life, make sure and be sure to come up with an extraordinary product. Don't be like the rest of the guy. Don't be an ordinary guy, otherwise it's useless. It was Junior Kyaku. I guess I'll see you for sure on the next episode of No Limit.